and a warm welcome to today's edition of podcast today is tuesday february 28 2023 i am rifat mandan in california and i am remotely joined by my good friend emilio madrigal who is in boston today we are very delighted to welcome dr yasmin but who is assistant professor and consultant of pathology at mayo clinic arizona she is going to deliver a talk today on pulmonary pathology and in fact she is planning to uh, present a series of lung pathology talks in the future as well and the title of her talk today is non small cell lung carcinoma pitfalls and mimics as always please feel free to post your questions and comments on youtube and facebook chat windows and we will pass them on to dr bhat at the end of the session and thank you for joining us today dr bhat over to you now hi thank you so much for the invitation to give this talk um hopefully everybody can hear me okay um so i uh, am a consultant and an assistant professor at mayo clinic in arizona and i'm going to talk to you today about non small cell carcinoma pitfalls and mimics So thank you everybody for joining and for those that are listening in later. Um as uh he said please feel free to type in your questions and I'll certainly uh, be happy to answer any questions at the end of the talk. All right, so let's jump right in. So pulmonary pathology can be challenging. Um and I have the unique benefit of being part of a high volume consult service here at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. We see on average um over 4000 cases a year. And we're a little bit unique here in that we have a staffed service for our consults. Um so it really doesn't matter if I get one case a day or 20 cases a day. So I'm somewhat motivated uh, to teach as much as possible. Uh certainly makes my workload a little bit lighter, but always happy to see any case is that folks might have. And one of the benefits of a consult service is that a lot of the times when you hear hoof bleeds, we actually do see zebras, which is kind of fun. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it can confusing. Sometimes you meet see something like this. Is it a horse? Is it a zebra? Is it something in between? Uh and for those of you that have to know, this is a leopard appaloosa, but won't be quizzing you on this later. Um and You know, in addition to the zebras and the zebra horse lookalikes, we see cases that cause routine challenges, you know, a very bread and bread and potatoes type of cases, and that's what I'm going to focus my talk on today. So, I'm going to be talking about non-small cell carcinoma, uh predominantly adenocarcinoma. We'll go over adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions, so adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, uh, invasive adenocarcinoma, we'll talk about subtypes. We'll go over some common questions that come up. Is something cancer? Is it a mimic? Uh is it a mimic of something malignant? Is it a mimic of something benign? whether or not there's invasion I'll spend a little time talking about micropapillary or maybe a lot of time as you may think and we'll have some case reviews sprinkled throughout and a couple at the end uh to help uh bring the concepts home So for non-small cell carcinoma of course you have squamous cell carcinoma which we won't be touching on today we'll be focusing more on adenocarcinoma so we have our spectrum lesions as i mentioned AIS and MIA and then of course invasive adenocarcinoma we have histologic subtypes that are you have to list for adenocarcinomas the non-mucinous variants lipidic acinar papillary micropapillary and solid and this drives our current grading scheme and we'll be talking more about this in a moment and then of course you have invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma So the current grading scheme which is in the new WHO although it's from 2020 so not quite as new anymore um this is based off of the IASLC uh histopathologic grading scheme and again this is for non-mucinous so remember you're not going to be giving histologic subtypes for mucinous adenocarcinomas you have grades 1 2 and 3 well moderately and poorly differentiated And so this is why these patterns become so important since a grading scheme is driven by these patterns. So for well differentiated adenocarcinoma they have to be lipidic predominant and they have either no or less than 20% of a high grade pattern. From moderately differentiated you have acinar or papillary predominant again with no or less than a 20% high grade pattern and then for poorly differentiated this would be any tumor that has greater than or equal to 20% of a high grade pattern and so what do i mean by high grade pattern so you have solid and micropapillary as well as cribriform and complex glandular patterns and you may ask what do you mean by cribriform or comp- complex glandular patterns that's not one of the five patterns we uh support <clears throat> 
Well, the cribriform or complex glandular pattern is technically considered type of acinar pattern, but it's considered poorly differentiated, where acinar is considered moderately differentiated which is a little frustrating. I, I think the idea behind this, and I wasn't in the room when these decisions were made, is that they didn't want to add additional patterns since we already had five. But just to keep in mind, when you see cribriform, those punched out glands or complex glandular pattern, which is single cells um, in uh, desmoplastic stroma um, or very unusual looking uh, acinar patterns, uh, those would be considered a high grade uh, pattern. And there's also been a suggestion that five, a 5% 5 cutoff rather than a 20% cutoff may be appropriate going forward in this grading system. Um, so keep a lookout for this in uh, future iterations, um, because as you're all uh, likely aware, in the current uh, CAP templates, you report patterns down to 5%. Okay, so I want to take a minute to mention uh, BAC, uh, bronchioloalveolar carcinoma. You still may hear this from radiologists and clinicians, hopefully not pathologists, but what was previously called BAC is now encompassed by multiple different entities, lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, as well as in situ mucinous adenocarcinoma. So essentially you have the lesions on the left in green, which have very good prognoses. You have mucinous adenocarcinoma, which has a very poor prognosis, and you have in situ mucinous adenocarcinoma, which technically exists, but not a diagnosis I uh, would typically make. Regardless, these are all very different entities, uh, and therefore, please don't use the term BAC. And whenever you have an opportunity to educate your clinical colleagues who may still be using this terminology, because I think it can be quite misleading uh, whether or not someone has a good prognosis or a poor prognosis. Okay. So before we jump into some additional things, I wanted to take a minute to talk about IHC and lung cancer. Um, and this might seem really basic, and I apologize for those that it is, but I do think it's always important to review. Um, you know, for adenocarcinoma, your positive markers, CK7, TTF1, NAPS and A, squamous cell carcinoma, P40, P63, CK56, uh, and then of course, small cell carcinoma, you'll again, will be TTF1 positive, and then your endocrine markers such as synaptophysin and chromogranin. Pitfalls that come up in these uh, simple stains is that P63 can stain up to 25% of lung adenocarcinomas. And I think there are still quite a few labs that routinely use a P63 or a CK56 rather than a P40. And I always advise if you do have P40, um, I, I tend to favor that uh, rather than using a P63 just because of this nonspecific staining pattern. So in general, if you have the same cell staining with TTF1 and P63, that's going to be uh, likely an adenocarcinoma rather than a squamous cell carcinoma versus if you have cell staining strongly for P40 uh, and they may have some weak positivity for TTF1, you're going to favor then a squamous cell carcinoma. And then I always like to make this plug, neuroendocrine markers in the absence of neuroendocrine morpholo morphologic features are just not clinically significant. Um, when I get uh, small biopsies and I'm and the differential is a non-small cell carcinoma, adeno versus squay, maybe it has a solid pattern, my standard limited panel will be TTF1 and a P40, and typically that will uh, take care of uh, what it needs to uh, while preserving tissue for any molecular studies that might need to be done. So those are some tips on uh, basic staining uh, for non-small cell carcinoma. Uh, and definitely do not perform routine neuroendocrine markers when you don't see neuroendocrine morphology. Okay, so back to our adenocarcinoma spectrum lesions. So just a quick review of the definitions. So atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, these are typically less than or equal to five millimeters. This is not a biopsy diagnosis. We'll go over what they look like in a minute. It's it's going to be an incidental finding. Usually you'll see them in lobectomies of patients that are having resections for uh, cancer elsewhere. Adenocarcinoma in situ has to be less than or equal to three centimeters by definition. So again, in lung cancer staging, size is very important, so keep that in mind. And it must consist of a purely lipidic architecture. And minimally invasive adenocarcinoma has to be lipidic predominant and have five millimeters or less of an invasive pattern. And then what do we mean by invasion? Well, any pattern other than lipidic is by definition invasive in the lungs. So that's our acinar, papillary, micropapillary, and solid. So finally, we get to some pictures. So here's an example of atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. This lesion was less than five millimeters. It's about a millimeter and a half. Um, you see some enlarged, uh, somewhat atypical, but 
fairly mild atyp atypia of these pneumocytes lining the slightly thickened alveolar septa. And then you can see in the background, this patient has some pigmented macrophages. This, this was a smoker. And this was an incidental finding seen in a patient that had a lobectomy for an adenocarcinoma, uh, adenocarcinoma elsewhere. Um, so in my experience, people that have multiple foci of atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, as they are considered precursor lesions, are more likely to uh, develop uh, adenocarcinoma uh, lesion, uh, invasive adenocarcinoma lesions down the road. So I still do mention them uh, in my comments and in additional findings. So here's an example of adenocarcinoma in situ. Looks very similar to that AAH that we just looked at, but it's much larger. Um, remember for AIS, you have to have less than or equal to three centimeters, uh, and they have to be pure lipidic pattern. So size is everything in, in, a in, in these types of cases. Uh, typically, uh, when I think about AAH and AIS, the amount of atypia should be within the same spectrum. If I start to see quite a lot of atypia, I would really question a diagnosis of AIS and look for an occult perhaps micropapillary pattern, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Here's an example of minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. So most of it's lipidic. You can see there's it's kind of involving a scar here. And then there's an acinar uh, area here with these angulated glands um, forming your area of invasion that was less than five millimeters. So this qualified for minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. Now, I always like to make these comments about AIS and MIA. These diagnoses should be rare. Uh, even if you look at the original studies uh, put out looking at thousands of stage one cases, they were still only like one to 3% of cases. So if you find yourself thinking about this diagnosis every single day, you might be over-diagnosing it. Um, and my recommendation would be don't underdiagnose diagnose or micropapillary patterns for lipidic and call something a much uh, lower stage, an AIS and MIA case that might actually be uh, true invasive. Um, you know, I don't think we're doing patients any favors by underdiagnosing um, these types of cases. There are some that might disagree with me, but lung cancer does kill. Uh, it's not like prostate, you know, 3-3 Gleason cancer where people tend to die with it rather than from it. Lung cancer does kill people. Um, and so I'm very careful uh, when I'm making a diagnosis of AIS or MIA. And certainly you have to submit the entire lesion if you're considering this diagnosis. And I typically will not um, consider this diagnosis on a biopsy. Uh, if it is low grade and the imaging fits, you can mention it in a comment as a possibility. Uh, but I would never top line something in a biopsy, AIS or MIA. All right, so back to our patterns. So quick review, adenocarcinoma, acinar subtype, this is probably one of the more common ones that you'll see and most easy to identify. You see angulated glands, you have a desmoplastic stroma in the background, um, certainly a typical, no question uh, that these are uh, malignant glands uh, with this uh, atypical architecture. Here is a papillary pattern on low power. You can see uh, fiber vascular cores and these frond-like structures. And here's a little bit higher power, again, showing you those fibrovascular cores and the frond-like structures, papillary subtype, same papillary adenocarcinoma that you see elsewhere in the body. So back to micropapillary and solid. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of these. And so why do we care? Why are we talking about these patterns? They have to be 5% or 20%. And, and why is this important? Well, the presence of micropapillary or solid patterns, even if they're not predominant, even down to 5%, um, is a risk factor for predicting poor recurrence-free survival in very early stage lung adenocarcinomas. And I have one uh, reference listed here, but this has been shown time and time again in multiple papers. And so it really is important to recognize these. And I'll say anecdotally, at least in my own practice, when I see micropapillary pattern, you're more likely to have spread through air spaces. You're more likely to see lymph node mets. I'm more likely to see a pleural invasion. Um, and so, you know, these are important patterns uh, to recognize because it does mean something for the patient. So here's a micropapillary subtype. You can see these florets of cells. They typically have a higher cytologic grade than you might see in others, although that doesn't always hold true. And here's an example of a solid subtype. You know, typically in solid, uh, you know, there's a large ugly mitotic figure here, just nests of cells. When you have solid, of course, your differential is probably going to be um, a squamous cell carcinoma. And so I have a very low threshold for ordering my TTF1 and P40 in these cases, in particular in biopsies, and then perhaps even again on resection um, to make sure that you don't miss an adenal squamous carcinoma. So this micropapillary pattern, this I find is actually quite a common miss. Um, and that's because there's so many different 
subpatterns of the patterns. You know, we like the word pattern in, in lung cancer. So you have that classical florette like look uh, that we talked about. And then you also have this more newly recognized variant called filigree. And this has a specific definition. You have delicate lace like narrow stacks. At least three nuclei are piled outwards. And so the point of that is to avoid tangential cutting issues. You don't want to call something micropapillary that might actually just be papillary. And then again, to differentiate from papillary, you wouldn't have fibrovascular cores. You also have a stromal pattern. And so that's when you have these nests of micropapillary cells infiltrating into the stroma. You can have airspace micropapillary pattern uh, in acinar or papillary in the background. Um, or you can have a background of a lipidic pattern. And so you might wonder, well, if I have micropapillary, but there's a background lipidic or back background acinar, what do I call it? Call it micropapillary. That micropapillary pattern will supersede whatever pattern it seems to be kind of sitting on top. You can have ring forms, you can have single cell forms, and some of the bodies are actually not uncommon. And sometimes that might serve as a clue of an under, uh, overlooked micropapillary pattern, because those definitely pop out on low power. So here's some photos. So here's a micropapillary kind of classical floret pattern. You can see uh, the cytologic atypia of these cells is a little bit higher, um, you know, very kind of ugly looking, some single cells forming little florets. This one even has a little ring-like look to it. And then the background is, you might say, well, lipidic versus acinar. Uh, but if you see this field, this field would be called micropapillary in terms of calculating your percentages. Here's another example of those florets. Again, um, they're kind of pseudo florets. You don't really have a true core in the center. You just have these cells forming these little rings floating in these spaces. And then here's an example showing some of that ring morphology. OK, so those little open rings. And again, you shouldn't see fibrovascular cores in the center. Here's an example with somoma bodies. This particular case had a combination of papillary and micropapillary. You can pick out the, mic the uh, papillary here, sorry, with some fibrovascular cores, and then also these ring forms for micropapillary. And then this is an example of that filigree pattern, which can be really sneaky and you might miss it. So this is actually from that same case. You can see here some ring forms here. And then if you look over here on the left, you can see these tiny little stalks uh, coming up. There's no fibrovascular core. They're more than three cells high. Uh, so these are the filigree pattern of micropapillary up there in the corner. Here's a higher power picture of a different case, again, showing you that filigree pattern. All right, you don't have a true fibrovascular core. You just have stacked cells. All right, little fronds floating out there in the in the air. And here's another example of that. Um, so be on the lookout for these subtypes of micropapillary and don't miss them. Here's an example showing you some single cells. Again, you know, if you're wondering if something is an artifact, you just have cells sort of uh, floating away because of poor fixation. Um, I find that looking at the cytologic features can be helpful since micropapillary tends to be high, higher cytologic grade. And if you look at these cells are quite ugly, uh, these single cells floating out here, and then you can see the start of kind of a, a filigree look here. It's sort of stacking up um, and uh, piling out here without any true fibrovascular cores. So uh, hopefully this would be easily recognizable as a micropapillary. So here's another example that you might quickly look at and say, well, you know, acinar, maybe a little lipidic. Um, you start to try to measure the acinar areas. And go, ah, is it MIA? You know, what does this look like? But there's actually some sneaky micropapillary in here. And hopefully you're able to catch it. So you can see these uh, clusters of cells. All right, higher cytologic grade, looking a little ugly, um, and uh, floating in these spaces here. Okay, and this is a background of, of acinar pattern. So here's a needle core biopsy of a case um, from a patient that had a solid uh, with a focal ground glass. So I would argue that there's acinar on the left here. You can see some desmoplastic stroma and some angulated glands. And then on the right, this is all mac micropapillary here. You can see individual cells, maybe little florets. And you know, I think it's important to correlate with imaging because oftentimes you might have a biopsy or even a resection that you end up calling poorly differentiated because it's micropapillary predominant or there's a micropapillary component there. And the radiologist or the oncologist may come back and say, but this was ground glass on imaging. And when they see ground glass, you often think of lipidic, right? Um, but micropapillary also shows up as ground glass on imaging oftentimes. And so this is an important correlation, I think, uh, to keep in mind. This uh, core nicely fit 
with what the imaging said. The solid component corresponded to the acinar and the ground glass corresponded to the micropapillary. So certainly not a question um, of an AIS MIA type lesion. This is moderately to poorly differentiated. All right, so with that prelude, we'll jump into what we call in our consult service, the usual problem, which is we have a biopsy on this lesion, is it cancer? As I'm sure you're all aware, we're seeing more and more biopsies of smaller lesions as uh, uh, screening protocols have changed in patients who have long smoking histories. And so they're getting high resolution CT imaging and we're getting more and more biopsies, uh, which is good because we're catching tumors earlier and we're able to resect them. So I'll give you the received history and what the outside thought. And then I'll show you a couple of pictures, let you think about what you might wanna call this. We don't have a true interactive polling since this is a, a online a lecture, but I want you to think about what you might call it and then we'll go over it and I'll tell you uh, what we ended up signing it out as. So this came as a 78 year old man. He had a 2.1 centimeter ground glass lesion that was biopsied. The outside group was divided on whether it was reactive findings versus a well differentiated malignancy. So I'll show you a couple of slides here without much commentary and let you think about what you might call it. And we'll go back and look at these pictures afterwards as well. A little bit higher power. Okay, so how would you sign this out? Um, a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, moderately to poorly differentiated, atypical pneumocyte proliferation, reactive benign, not sure send it out. So anytime I assign out a case, I know it seems simple, but I think it's important to think about how your diagnosis will be received. You know, and if you call something a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma or moderately to poorly differentiated, that patient's gonna get treatment, right? If you call it an atypical pneumocyte proliferation, it's not as helpful to the clinician. Then they're left with the question of, well, do I rebiopsy? Do I watch? What do I do? And sometimes you are, and you have to end up with this diagnosis, but I try to avoid this as much as possible. Reactive benign, no additional treatment, and not sure send it out. You can put off the decision for a couple of days. So for this particular case, if we look at this biopsy, it's nicely inflated. Thankfully, we don't have a ton of crush artifact. I think we could argue that it's a uh, pretty distinctive benign on the left. And on the right, you start to see these atypical cells. They're much larger. Um, hopefully, I can convince you that they're forming angulated glands here. All right, maybe even a little bit of complex gland there. And then when you start to look out at higher power, you can see these individual cells. Now, some of these cells are macrophages. Um, but not all of them, right? The cell is much larger. Um, you can see hyperchromasia on the nuclei, starting to look atypical. And you look at these atypical lining cells starting to pile up. And then you see these individual atypical cells floating, maybe forming a floret, maybe not, hard to say. Um, but certainly, uh, definitely not something that I would call benign. And so I ended up calling this a moderately to poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with acinar and micropapillary subtypes. And I think that this is not uncommon for me to end up calling cases uh, higher, like a higher grade than what it might come as. And a couple of clues that are helpful in this particular case is looking at the cytologic features of the individual cells compared to the benign pneumocytes in the background, which you have some nice um, examples of, and then also looking at the architecture. I think it's easy to miss sometimes this uh, atypical architecture, but if you look at this piece here in contrast to this piece here, hopefully you'll be able to recognize that as something that is malignant. So these are, this case nicely highlights a lot of the features that I look at when we get these questions of, is this cancer? Uh, one thing is to look at the background. If there's a lack of acute lung injury, and we'll talk about this in, uh, later in the, in the lecture, but when you have acute lung injury in the lung, you can get really reactive looking pneumocytes. Um, you can get quite a bit of atypia in the pneumocytes, and it doesn't necessarily equate to malignancy. Um, and so in the background, like in this particular case, is quite clean. There's no organizing pneumonia. There's no diffuse cellular damage. I don't see giant cells. I don't see granulomas. Um, then you really start to take that atypia quite seriously. 
Another feature that can be very helpful, uh, especially if you have good, good biopsies, is an abrupt transition from the abnormal areas of definitively benign lung to the atypical looking areas. If you can just draw a line in between those areas and you don't see kind of a gradual transition, which is what you often see in cases of reactive pneumocyte atypia, that can be helpful. Of course, cytologic features like hyperchromasia and nucleoli, although you don't always see these in lung cancer, that can be a tricky side of it. Uh, and then a regular architecture of the atypical cells. So architecture is so important. You know, we've been harping on the patterns and talking about that, but that architecture is so important in lung cancer. When I start to see piling up or crowding of the pneumocytes, uh, I start to get very concerned that what I'm looking at is in fact a malignant process. And that cytologic atypia. I always say, go to 40X and take a look. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Um, but when it is there, it can be very helpful. And try comparing to benign pneumocytes and see, is that transition abrupt? So all of these features together can be very helpful when you're trying to decide if something is malignant or reactive. Okay, so let's go to another case. So my history for this case was a 58-year-old with a pet avid nodule adjacent to a site of previously treated adenocarcinoma. He's a long-standing smoking history. And the outside was concerned that the patient has residual recurrent adenocarcinoma, which often does happen in patients. So again, I'll let you look at a couple of slides and sort of try to form your own opinion on how you might call this case if this case was on your desk. Remember, this patient had previously treated adenocarcinoma. Uh, at this time, I didn't have any history of that treatment, but I knew he had treatment, and now he has new pet avidity in an area immediately adjacent to his area of treatment. And they're worried that the cancer is back. Another high power here. And one more. Okay, so if this case was on your desk, how would you sign it out? Well differentiated adeno or moderately to poorly differentiated adeno, a typical pneumocyte proliferation, a reactive benign process, or not sure send it out. And again, always keep in mind, if you call it adenocarcinoma, that patient might receive additional treatment, a lobectomy even, um, call it atypical, not super helpful. The clinician will follow or maybe rebiopsy. If you call it benign, no additional treatment. All right, that patient's going to just continue undergoing whatever surveillance they were undergoing and, you know, put it off a few more days. So if we go back and look at this case, you know, certainly you start to notice the atypia right away, right? These cells are larger, they're fairly hyperchromatic, um, but they have a lot of cytoplasm, right? And I, I'm hoping you guys can see my mouse. Um, they have quite a bit of uh, cytoplasm. You start to look around even more. You see those very large atypical cells. They're, they're really bizarre. They're almost too bizarre um, from what you normally see in adenocarcinoma. And they have this very stretched out look in a lot of areas, almost like a taffy, like if you took the cells and you pulled them. And some of them are vacuolated. So you can see here, there's some vacuolization in these cells here. Some vacuolization almost looks like vacuolization in the in the nucleus here, but more in the more in the cytoplasm, and it's very stretched out, taffy-like. It's it's almost as if you took a, a, a wet towel and draped it over the the septum or what's left over it. There's certainly a background of fibrosis and inflammation in this case. So this is an example of radiation atypia. And it's actually a quite nice example of it. So I sign this out as radiation-induced pneumonitis, negative for malignancy. No additional treatment needed for this patient other than their standard surveillance. So radiation atypia, the clinical history is key. Um, when I initially received this case, I didn't actually have the history of radiation, so I had to do a little digging to find it. Um, and then also knowing, is the area that you're looking at in the radiation field, right? And you see these very classic, large, bizarre, atypical looking cells. When something starts to look so ugly, you're like, wait, this is either like a pleomorphic carcinoma or completely benign. Um, and despite the large nuclei, they will have a low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. You have lots of cytoplasm to go together with those large nuclei. And then you often see that vacuolization and that stretched out taffy-like appearance uh, that I was mentioning before. Um, and they often have a lack of hyperchromasia. I have found this doesn't always hold true, but it often is the case where you have a very soft look uh, to the chromatin. So here's another example. Um, this case has a little bit more of that vacuolization. All right, but again, you see that stretched out look, like you just took the cell and you, and you stretched it out. 
is another example. You see quite atypical, quite large cells, um, but with lots of cytoplasm and some vacuolization. And oftentimes in these cases, or almost always actually in these cases of radiation atypia, the background will be of this kind of fibroelastotic scar look. It's not going to be a, a normal lung necessarily in the background. That again, does not always hold true, especially if you're getting to the edge of the radiation field. But I have found oftentimes you'll see this kind of fibroelastotic scar look in the background. So that can be a clue as well. Another example, this one has more of that soft look to the nuclei with the fluffy uh, sort of pseudovacuolated cytoplasm here, some more vacuolated cytoplasm there. All right, so that's an important carcinoma mimic. So there's two other carcinoma mimics that I wanted to touch on. Uh, one is peribronchiolar metaplasia, um, also you know, part of small airways remodeling, also called lambertosis. And the last would be reactive pneumocyte atypia. So I'm going to start off with PBM or peribronchiolar metaplasia. Um, it has multiple names. I like PBM because it's really intrinsically descriptive and tells you exactly what you're looking at. This is a reactive process and it's indicative of chronic damage to small airways. So of course, lots of different things can cause damage to small airways, infection, aspiration, drug reactions, any kind of inhalational disease, smoking, vaping, toxic fume exposure, you were pulled out of a house fire. Um, lots of things can cause damage to your small airways. Now, thankfully, this is typically not a biopsy problem. Uh, people are not going to get a biopsy for PBM, right? This is going to be something that you're going to see secondarily in wedges or lobectomies. Um, it can be relevant. However, in patients who have multiple ground glass lesions and concurrent small airway damage. And so you may have a lobectomy specimen and you're trying to decide how to stage that patient. Do they have multiple AIS lesions or do they have multiple invasive adenocarcinoma or is it one adenocarcinoma with intralobar metastases? So it can be important uh, to be able to recognize this in the neoplastic setting. Of course, we care about it quite a lot in the non-neoplastic setting, but we'll not be talking about that today. So here's an example of PBM or peribronchiolar metaplasia. You can see on low power, easily this could be confused or um, thought of to look like lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, right? You have hyperchromasia, it's lining the um, alveolar spaces, sure looks like lipidic adenocarcinoma to me. If you look at the inset in the upper left, it shows you cilia. So oftentimes you're quite lucky, you do get cilia uh, with these, although you don't always. So that is not always a reliable indicator. Now, if you see it, you're good to go. Um, but if you don't, you might have to do something else. And this case even has a little bit of squamous metaplasia up in the right-hand side. All right, and similar often to adenocarcinomas, they may be adjacent to bronchovascular bundles as you're seeing here, but PBM is always going to originate out from a bronchovascular bundle. All right, here's another example. Again, this case didn't really have cilia. Um, that was obvious and certainly could be mistaken for lipidic uh, predominant adenocarcinoma. So one trick that I love to use is a P40. So PBM will have an intact basal cell layer, unlike adenocarcinoma. So if you look at the top panels, um, adenocarcinoma, h &E on the upper left, you can see those atypical looking cells. And there's actually probably some uh, micropapillary single cell pattern in here as well. Um, and if you look at that TTF1, it'll nicely highlight all that adenocarcinoma. And then on the bottom um, is peribronchiolar metaplasia. Again, looks kind of like lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma. I don't see any obvious cilia on this particular case. Um, but when you do the TTF1, it's also positive. So that's not helpful. But when you look at the P40, there is no basal intact basal cell layer with adenocarcinoma, right? So that's going to be negative. But in PBM, it's going to show you that nice intact basal cell layer. Uh, so this is an excellent trick um, that can help you uh, identify uh, PBM. All right. Now, uh, here's an example of uh, PBM in interstitial lung disease. So I guess I am going to show you a little bit of ILD. Um, uh, and as you see here, these atypical looking cells, but if you look a little closer, there are actually cilia on some of them. So you're able to identify uh, this here. It's a little bit higher power to show you the cilia, nice terminal bar. Um, but this is kind of exuberant PBM here. And you might think that this is an adenocarcinoma arising in a background of interstitial lung disease, which certainly can happen. Okay. So this is where I like to bring in my uh, ticks and fleas, uh, which is to say, remember, one diagnosis doesn't actually preclude another. So here's a case of a patient with a lobectomy, heavy smoker. You can tell that right off the bat. They have hyalinized fibrosis and respiratory bronchiolitis, almost going to DIP. So definitely a smoker. Um, but they had a biopsy-proven adenocarcinoma, but multiple ground glass slash solid lesions. 
So you look at this and you create, you're like, all right, what, what's going on here? Um, here's the airway, here's your bronchovascular bundle. Here's another bronchovascular bundle up here on the right. And then you have some atypical looking glands or some fibrosis sort of distorting the architecture. It might be a little unclear what's going on. So this is a great example of where P40 might be helpful. So here's the P40. And you can see the P40 nicely highlights the PBM on the top. But then this is all actually adenocarcinoma on the bottom. And I would say uh, acinar subtype um, adenocarcinoma. All right, here's another uh, picture. I think this was actually from the same case, but a different area. So again, you have this atypical hyperchromatic lining, kind of an abrupt transition to surrounding areas, patients a smoker, you're thinking about adenocarcinoma. Um, and then there's also something going here on the right. Maybe there's some cilia, hard to tell on this power. But then when you do your P40, yep, those were cilia. There's your intact um, uh, basal cell layer. So this is PBM on the right, and then adenocarcinoma on the left. And I should uh, make a note here about a caveat for this P40 trick, which you don't want to get um, dropped into. So even though P40 is negative, it doesn't necessarily intrinsically make something malignant, right? So if you have an intact basal cell layer, that tells you that something is benign. If you don't have a basal cell layer, it still could just be reactive pneumocytes um, in a process to infection, aspiration, uh, drugs, anything like that. So reactive pneumocytes won't have an intact basal cell layer. It's just the peribronchial metaplasia that will. Um, so again, very helpful when it's positive. If it's negative, it makes you think about adenocarcinoma, but doesn't prove that it's adenocarcinoma. So it's a really important sort of layered uh, thing to keep in mind for this P40 trick. Okay, so I want to talk then about reactive pneumocyte atypia. So I would say this is the most common mimic that's mistaken for adenocarcinoma uh, in my experience. So you will see in association with acute lung injury or inflammation, really markedly atypical pneumocytes. The pneumocytes can get pretty jazzed up. And often the, uh, the degree of the atypia can be beyond what you see in many malignancies. And so the other caveat there then is that the cytologic atypia, when there is helpful, but in pneumocytes, it doesn't always equal malignancy. And so this leads me to my next pearl, which is the background is key. Background is so key in, in these cases. So here's a biopsy of organizing pneumonia. So you can see that you have plugs of, of proliferating fibroblasts in these alveolar spaces. This particular stain is a little bit, a little bit pinker um, than what I'm used to looking at, but you can make out the plugs filling those alveolar spaces. And when you look on high power and you look at those individual cells, those are right up there with some of the cytologic atypia that you might see in association with a malignancy. However, there are lining alveolar septa that you can make out, and there's a background of organizing pneumonia. And so for this particular case, I would step way, way back and not call this um, adenocarcinoma. This would just be reactive pneumocyte atypia in a case of organizing pneumonia. And this particular patient was actually had an adverse drug reaction. Here's another example. You can see some pneumocyte atypia. There's even some nucleoli in these cases. However, context is key. Um, these are reactive pneumocytes in a patient that actually had, this is late stage organizing diffuse alveolar damage. All right. And um, this particular patient actually had COVID. So again, the cytologic atypia can be helpful, but the background and the context that you see it in is so, so important. Here's another example. All right, if I showed you this in isolation without any history, you might say, well, there's abrupt transition. There's, you know, it's, the cytologic atypia is not terrible, but it is there and it's noticeable. And you can kind of draw a line between where it stops. You might, might be worried about a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma here. But when I give you the history, the 25-year-old man with a pneumothorax, this is reactive pneumocyte atypia. And you can actually see atypia that's much worse than this in patients with pneumothoraces. Um, they can mimic adenocarcinoma, but in fact, they're not. So again, um, a lot of lung biopsies, I mean, pathology in general, I think you shouldn't sign out in a vacuum, but it's so important to look at the background and to look at the history, to look at where these specimens are coming from to help guide you, especially in gray zone cases that have overlapping features. So here's a patient with chronic fibrosing interstitial lung disease. All right, you see a nice little fibroblast focus there. Um, but there's some reactive pneumocytes. All right, if you look on high power, they can look really, really reactive. Uh, so definitely not something you, you know, there's even a mitotic figure here. Um, so, you know, on a small biopsy, you could easily be led astray. Uh, so again, you know, knowing the history is important. And certainly it would be unusual to get a small biopsy from a patient with ILD. You're more likely to get a wedge in this particular case. <clears throat> 
That said, we do often get biopsies from patients with ILD. So again, uh, clinical history and background, very important. Um, and sometimes you are left calling something atypical favor based off of clinical history or histologic features. Here's another case of ILD. And I show you these examples because we so often see these reactive pneumocyte atypia in ILD, uh, but you can also see uh, tumors arising in ILD. And so you don't wanna miss those either. But again, you know, you might argue, oh gosh, these are really ugly. Is that floating in the space? Is, you know, look, look at these cells. Um, could it be acinar pattern? But in the background of all that fibrosis, and it doesn't extend any farther, I would not go out on a limb and call something like this cancer. All right, a little bit higher power there. But again, just to show you the level of atypia you can get in a pneumocyte, uh, often quite beyond what you might see in a malignant process. Okay, so there are, of course, exceptions because there are exceptions and caveats to everything. So remember, when you get complex architecture, you really want to go towards malignancy. Cytologic features may or may not matter, right? So you can have bland cytologic features, but complex architecture, and that makes something malignant in the lung. So here's an example. These pneumocytes are pretty bland probably a little bit blander than what we saw in some of those ILD cases. And there's organizing pneumonia in the background. So you might say, hey, this isn't even as bad looking from a cytological standpoint. And there's acute lung injury in the background. This is benign reactive. But look at the architecture. Looks like it's forming maybe cribiform, maybe little solid uh, patterns, kind of maybe complex glands that, that is new in the WHO. Look at that, it's forming a solid nest of cells. And when in doubt, you can do stains, TTF1, CK7, pankeratin, whatever your, your stain of choice is. Here's an example of a CK7 in this case. So yes, you have tons of organizing pneumonia in the background, but this architectural pattern is incompatible with a benign process. And so when you start to see architectural complexity of these cells that stain with um, these pneumocytes, they are malignant. So don't fall down that pathway. All right. So you don't wanna miss tumor cells masquerading as reactive pneumocytes. So while we don't wanna call something cancer that's just reactive, you don't wanna miss tumor cells that are pretending to be reactive pneumocytes. All right, so here's an example, which uh, is always scary when I go back and look at it again. This was a consult case where the tumor was actually missed grossly and we had them go back and just put random sections in from a lobectomy. And I think it was like 40 or 50 slides, but we actually finally found the tumor. So if you look at this, you might brush over this as reactive pneumocytes. But if you look at the left side, you can see there's actually a contrast in the atypia that's on the right, all right? You start to see these more atypical looking cells. Here's a bit higher power. You know, and some of these might be macrophages. You're like, okay, macrophages, but maybe not. Some of these are looking a little bit bigger, a little hyperchromatic, a little pleomorphic. And when you do a TTF1, you see that these cells that are forming clusters in the alveolar spaces um, are positive for TTF1, so they're not macrophages. And so um, this has been described in the literature as like a DIP-like architecture. So like what you see in smokers, where you see lots of macrophages filling spaces, that's so-called disquamative interstitial pneumonia, which I'll admit is a terrible name, um, but it's that DIP-like architecture to the tumor. And here's some adjacent normal lung in the upper left-hand corner for comparison. So this is a normal pattern of pneumocytes, but then you start to see these large larger cells clustering in the spaces, that is actually tumor. And I've seen multiple cases like this where there's either, it's just completely missed grossly, or there's a confusion about, can, can we call this malignancy or are these just reactive pneumocytes? So don't miss these cases. It can be very, very tricky. Okay, so let's go to our next case. So here's a received history, 75 year old woman. She presented with a cough. She's a former smoker, 25 pack year, recently quit. She was given antibiotics and Advair, neither of which helped with her symptom. Imaging over the past couple of months showed worsening opacities are now turning into consolidations, most affecting the right lung bases with patchiness in the upper lung fields. So they decided to do a biopsy on her since she was not responding to her antibiotics. And the preliminary sign out came to me as mildly atypical mucinous epithelium sent for outside consultation. Okay, so again, I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides and let you form your own opinions on this case and then we'll go over them. All right, so how would you sign this one out? Would you call it atypical mucinous epithelium as the outside group did? Benign reactive, that's just peribronchial metaplasia. Um, you know, the patient has really bad pneumonia, 
mucinous adenocarcinoma or maybe send it out to somebody because you're not quite sure. You know, and again, the atypical, not so helpful, no additional treatment, they'll just keep giving antibiotics. And then mucinous, obviously the patient will, you know, get molecular and, and chemotherapy and all kinds of treatment. And then you can put it off for a couple of days. So if we go back and look at this, we see these tufts of cells, right? Partially lining alveolar spaces. And hopefully I can convince you that this is a pretty abrupt transition, right? Like it's kind of like you took a marker and you drew this and then you just drew a line right here, okay? And again here, this little tuft here. And you see lots of macrophages filled with mucin uh, in the alveolar spaces. And then you look at this structure, and I, I think this is probably one of the more compelling areas of this biopsy. You might uh, agree with me that it's forming acinar structures, actually, in addition to these kind of atypical lining cells, again, kind of abrupt to the surrounding area. You know, this area looks quite different than what we're seeing in the center. You go a little bit higher power, you might look around and say, gosh, are they are there cilia? I'm not sure. Is that a fuzzy border? Is it tumor? You know, if you're in question, you could always do a P40 if you thought about it. Um, I didn't on this particular case. So here is background definitive benign. This is from the same case. And then you contrast to that tuft. So hopefully I can convince you the difference here. So if you look at the top here, this is kind of a fuzzy looking ciliated border. You see goblet cells. All right, they have more of kind of speckles in the mucin versus you don't see that as much here. Um, you know, maybe more apical mucin, hard to say. Um, the, the cell sizes are not that different. So overall though, these findings are actually consistent with mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, and it's not uncommon to see these cases presenting like this where patients uh, come in with this refractory pneumonia with these bilateral opacities. Um, and this is more than enough to actually call this. So mucinous adenocarcinoma, this, this can be a tricky topic. Um, they're very aggressive and often multifocal. They can mimic pneumonia like we saw in the last case. Remember, you while you will see these subtypes, lipidic, acinar, uh, micropapillary, papillary, you don't report them. It's, it's not important because mucinous will typically do very bad. Um, so it's not as if you have a lipidic pattern mucinous, they're going to do well. Not the case. Um, you can see combined mucinous and non-mucinous cases. Lung cancer loves to be uh, heterogeneous and you often see uh, multiple different types. They can be really challenging on biopsy. And I think one of the reasons is that they're often cytologically bland, uh, similar to what we saw in that previous case. So what about staining for mucinous adenocarcinomas? Um, if you look at the staining patterns, again, I have some percentages up here, but you really don't need to know the percentages. The point is, is mucinous adenos can be positive or negative for CK7, positive or negative for CK20, positive or negative for TTF1. Even, K, even um, GI specific stains like CDX2 often have overlap. And basically it's not an IHC game. Um, I actually just had this, this question come up in tumor board this morning. You know, could this be metastatic pancreatic mucinous adenocarcinoma? And the, and the answer is always, Yes, it could be. Uh, the stains are not really helpful. There's no magic stain. And so, you know, in my practice, I, I typically won't even stain mucinous adenocarcinomas. I just sign them out as mucinous adenocarcinomas and put a comment and that you need imaging and clinical history for differentiation. If you have a patient like ours here where they presented with multiple uh, lung lesions, they have nothing elsewhere in the body, it's likely lung primary. Patient with multiple lung lesions and a pancreatic lesion, very likely that's going to be pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and they can perfectly mimic mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung up to and including that beautiful lipidic architecture. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, this was a 75-year-old man. He was diagnosed with interstitial lung disease with bilateral uh, reticulations and some kind of ground glass look. And when we received the wedges, this is what it looked like. Uh, you see these little abortive tufts of cells lining the spaces in this discontinuous fashion. This is very classic of how mucinous adenocarcinoma will grow. You see the cells are really bland, right? And they often have these basally oriented nuclei with this abundant apical cytoplasm. It's a very common look. If you give me this on biopsy, I feel comfortable calling this mucinous adenocarcinoma, uh, even though the cytology is so, so bland, because this is classic with what these uh, things look like. About the only thing that can look similar would be mucinous metaplasia and PBM, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in a little while, uh, but to remember that that is typically not something that's going to be biopsied. And of course, you always have your P40 trick if you're concerned about that.
So here's another example of that same case. Again, this one has less mucin, um, but that's not uncommon to see a variation in the amount of mucin you see in the cells. Here's an area with tons of mucophages, the so-called macrophages uh, filled with mucin. And you can see the actual tumor cells are forming these very small little strips right there. It's a little tuft right there and a little tuft right there. So again, uh, you know, if you see these little tufts on small biopsies, you can feel comfortable diagnosing that as a mucinous adenocarcinoma, especially in the correct uh, radiologic context. This is an example from a 65-year-old woman. She had, again, presumed pneumonia, like that first index case I showed you, refractory to treatment, and here was the biopsy. Now, this is just one field. She had more tumor elsewhere, but I'd like to show this field because you have some extracellular mucin, some macrophages with mucin, and then this one little tuft. So oftentimes you get these very focal discontinuous um, cells, and this is sufficient to call something mucinous adenocarcinoma in my book. All right. Here's another example of a patient with a four centimeter ground glass lesion on imaging. All right, and they actually just went in and took it out presumptively. She didn't have a biopsy. So this was uh, from the wedge. And you can see this beautiful lipidic pattern, you know, and again, unlike with classic adenocarcinoma, lipidic pattern for mucinous doesn't necessarily portend a better diagnosis. Uh, and this sort of bleeds into what I briefly mentioned earlier, where while there is technically an in situ mucinous adenocarcinoma listed in the WHO, I'd be extremely hesitant to actually make that diagnosis. Um, so you can see these very bland looking cells with abundant mucin uh, nicely forming um, these, these uh, little tufts all along the alveolar septum. And again, to keep in mind, pancreatic adenocarcinoma can look identical to this. And so clinical history is really important to rule that out in these, case, in these cases. So caveats, as I briefly mentioned, you can have mucinous metaplasia in peribronchiolar metaplasia. Background is important. Again, you can always do that P40 if you're really concerned about it. Um, and look for cilia. If you see cilia, that's great. And you often are more likely to see cilia in cases that have uh, goblet cells and that mucinous metaplasia. And then also the goblet cells will be different. They'll be stuffed in between your uh, pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells versus the apical mucin in the pneumocyte, in the malignant pneumocyte that you'll see uh, in mucinous adenocarcinoma. So here's an example of mucinous metaplasia in, a, in an interstitial lung disease case. This one had some nice cilia that you could make out. And again, different uh, goblet cells stuffed in between of our pseudostratified cells. All right, so this was a case of uh, PBM. Here's another example. Again, that discontinuous growth pattern, which is so characteristic of mucinous adenocarcinoma, you can see it in PBM. And so you want to be really careful not to overcall something and then also not to miss something. So again, P40 and the presence of cilia, as you can see here in the inset in the lower left-hand corner, can be very helpful. Um, and then to keep in mind in interstitial lung disease cases, especially where you have small airway damage, you can get this mucostasis, which may mimic that extracellular mucin that you see in mucinous adenocarcinoma. So just, just a note of caution um, to put all the features together when you're, cons when you're trying to make this di differentiation between the two. All right. Okay, so let's go to the next case. So this is a 72-year-old woman. She had a ground glass lesion on imaging that was biopsied. So again, these are all cases that have come through our consult service as we're not quite sure, tumor or not tumor. So I'll show you a couple of slides, let you form your own thoughts. Okay, so how would you sign that up? Well differentiated adeno, well to poorly, atypical, reactive benign, or send it out. Okay, so if we go back and look at this case, you can see it's hard to tell if there's an abrupt transition. You might convince yourself there is, but I didn't show you enough of this piece of tissue. But when you look at these individual cells, they look a little atypical, a little hyperchromatic, and they're starting to pile up on each other, right? You don't have a single line. You have this, this crowding. So I always think of tumor cells as not getting along, right? They're, they're, not, they're not polite on the bus or on the train. They're always they're starting to crowd each other and, and, and elbow into each other's space. And then you start to see these florets of cells and individual cells that are clearly atypical floating in the alveolar spaces, all right? Okay, so you have architectural crowding. You have, a, you have these florets of cells that are starting to make you think about micropapillary. And so for this particular case, I called it uh, well to poorly differentiated because I think there's probably some lipidic, but I think there's also some micropapillary in there. Um, and so this is a good example of why you don't want to miss, how you don't want to miss a micropapillary in something that looks ground glass on imaging. 
Okay. So next case, 52-year-old woman, ah, and another point that I also wanted to, to mention in this particular case, look how clean the background is. You see, there's no organizing pneumonia, there's no diffuse alveolar damage, there's no giant cells, granulomas, there's nothing like that. Now that's not to say that you can't have those features and have cancer, you certainly can. Um, but when you start to see those features of acute lung injury, granulomas, you really wanna take a step back from using cytologic atypia and start to look more at your architectural features if you're considering cancer. Um, so again, very clean background on this case. So our next case, this was a 52-year-old lady, and she had multiple one to two centimeter nodules in her right upper lobe. So I'll show you a couple of pictures here. All right, so what do we think about this one? Atypical mucinous epithelium, which is how it came to us. Benign reactive, probably just PBM. Mucinous adeno, or not sure send it out. So if you look at this biopsy, we have what looks like extra extracellular mucin, okay? And then you have these clusters of cells that are just kind of floating. There's not a lot of good architecture that you can see. And lots and lots of mucin in the, in the cytoplasm. And so for this particular case, I actually did call this a mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, and I think this case nicely illustrates the, how you can use architectural complexity despite very bland cytologic features to call something mucinous adenocarcinoma. And I think the history is also good uh, for mucinous adeno. They often present as multiple nodules, although of course they don't have to. Um, so this case is always, I think, a good example of uh, how scary and how bland these, these cells can look. Uh, this case actually did come with stains. I don't have the stains on here, but these cells were CDX2 positive, CK20 positive, partial weak CK7, and partial weak TTF1. So just nice example of how you can also get that uh, mixed staining pattern in mucinous adenocarcinomas. I, pref I prefer to just save the tissue for molecular studies. Uh, I think that would be more valuable to the patient and just use radi radiology uh, to help uh, differentiate whether it's a lung primary or something metastasized from the GI tract. All right, next case, 78-year-old man with multiple bilateral solid and ground glass lesions. Okay, so for this particular case, I went in and did a wedge. So we have a lot of tissue to look at. So I'll let you take a look here. Hopefully this one is a little bit more obvious. Go through this a little quicker. So again, same options. Um, hopefully you came to the same conclusion. You know, you have these, you have a combination of different features in this case. You have these tufts with the abrupt transitions, right, with this apical uh, mucin here. And then I think this nicely highlights the difference between goblet cells and uh, what you see in mucinous adenocarcinoma, since, of course, that is what this case is. <laughs> Jump to the end there. Uh, but you can see this uh, basally oriented nucleus with abundant apical cytoplasm. So this case was also called mucinous adenocarcinoma. Although it's interesting because when you look at the low power, um, there are areas of more tradition, so-called traditional you know, adenocarcinoma that you might think of is still there's some apical mucin. This is more of an acinar pattern. You can see uh, down here in the right hand corner, less mucin. And, you know, on the low power, you can see mucophages filling the spaces. You can see this area kind of forming that so-called lipidic look with these abundant um, apical cytoplasm. And then this kind of abrupt tufts here and there. So you have all kinds of uh, different patterns of growth, which is again, common in lung adenocarcinoma, both mucinous and non-mucinous. So next case, that we're coming to the end here, it's an 88-year-old man with a right lower lobe and right middle lobe opacities. All right, so we got some pretty generous biopsies here. I'll let you take a look. All right, so why do we want to sign this one out? Atypical, well-differentiated, moderately or poorly differentiated adeno, or reactive benign. So if we go back and look at it, um, hopefully by this point in the talk, uh, you all feel really comfortable with recognizing micropapillary. You can see these florets of cells floating in the spaces here, okay? 
Um, and then in the background, there's also papillary. And papillary and micropapillary, you often see them together. Um, and you know, on those, you just want to make sure that you're not overcalling a micropapillary because sometimes you can get cross sections of the tips of the fibrovascular cores. But in this particular case, I think it's pretty clear that we have uh, individual uh, see pseudofluorets, single cells. It's not just getting the tips of the cores there. Um, so papillary and micropapillary pattern. And then also in this area, I thought there's some nicely hidden tumor. Um, I don't have a stain on this particular case, but if I did, you would see that this is tumor. This is tumor here admixed with macrophages. This is a, looks like a little fibrovascular core papillary structure right there. Um, some individual cells right there. So the tumor is pretty nicely admeshed um, with uh, macrophages in the background. So if this is the only piece you had, you might miss this. Um, and so when in doubt, you can do keratins. You could do a TTF1, uh, which would nicely highlight these cells. So I ended up calling this one a moderately to poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with both papillary and micropapillary subtypes. All right, next case. So this is a 75-year-old man. He had a lobectomy for a three-centimeter adenocarcinoma. And the section I'm showing you is away from the main, uh, car main carcinoma, and there was a concern for a second primary. So here's the lesion. So again, this patient had a lobectomy, was on my desk for adenocarcinoma, had a nice three centimeter adenocarcinoma, was acinar predominant. But then I saw this area in a distant section and I wondered, could the patient have intrapulmonary meds or just a second primary? So this is what it looked like. Let you look a little bit higher power. See pretty hypochromatic, maybe kind of crowded looking. Okay, so what would you do with this? Would you want to just call it a second well-differentiated adeno or a moderately to poorly differentiated adeno? Say there's some atypical pneumocytes in the background, you would, probably wouldn't want to do that on a lobectomy if you could avoid it, or order a stain, get a P40, or just it's reactive benign, don't even worry about it. So I actually ended up ordering a P40 on this case because this bothered me. I'll be honest. I saw this. I was like, gosh, I wonder if this is a second primary. Um, and however, if you look high power, after doing this P40 here, which nicely highlights uh, intact basal cell layer, it's a little bit higher power, you can see the basal cells, pneumocytes, um, there are actually are cilia here. And it's, it's kind of that fuzzy border cilia. I think hopefully on this power, hopefully it's coming across well on your screens. I don't know if it will. You can, you can just make out, um, uh, uh, you can just make out the fuzzy, the, the fuzzy border cilia, real cilia. Um, and, you know, this case, I think nicely highlights how a benign reactive process can look very concerning for malignancy. And if you were to receive something this on bi uh, something like this on biopsy, for whatever reason, you could easily see going down the tubes on this one and calling it adenocarcinoma. Um, but the P40 nicely shows you that this is a benign reactive process. And so once again, highlighting how cytologic atypia can lead you one direction or another in the wrong context. And so to be careful and to use your stains um, when, you're, when you're not sure. So this was just a background of peribronchial metaplasia. It was benign reactive, no second tumor, no upstaging to T3. Okay, I think this might be the last case. 85-year-old man, he had interstitial lung disease, and a section from a diagnostic wedge was shown. So this is an area from his ILD case. You can see some mucin maybe going on here. But then when you look on high power, hopefully everyone is convinced by the cilia here, nice terminal bar. Um, so for this particular case, I did not go down the mucinous adenocarcinoma route. Um, I called this just a component of injury to the small airways. This was peribronchial metaplasia uh, and not cancer. All right, I, just kidding, there's one more case. <laughs> so 67 year old, she had a 1.2 centimeter ground glass lesion on imaging. All right, so we had really generous biopsies. This was really nice, okay. So take a look at this. Hopefully one of the first things that's striking you is how clean the background is. There's no acute lung injury here. A little bit higher power. Different piece. Higher power there. All right, so we're we gonna call this well to moderate, moderate to poorly, atypical pneumocyte, reactive benign. So again, that background is very clean. You can draw lines. It's, it's almost as if I took the pieces with the atypical areas and just like 
Photoshop them into an area of benign lung. I promise I didn't do that. This is, a, this is how the case came. You start to see a lot of those features we talked about, nuclear crowding, hyperchromasia, a little bit of atypia. You can see some nucleoli starting to form here. Um, I would argue this is forming an acinar structure here. All right, so I call this well to moderately with both lipidic and acinar subtypes. And in fact, there is one more case. <laughs> I just had so many good cases I wanted to show you. So it's a 72-year-old woman with a ground glass lesion on imaging that was biopsied. All right, show you this biopsy here. This one should look familiar. Hopefully be a good callback. All right, so hopefully everyone remembers this case and you can recognize the micropapillary pattern and the architectural crowding, all right, and well to poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, all right. So with that, I thank you all for your attention as I went through sort of the basics of adenocarcinoma and how to diagnose them and mucinous adenocarcinoma and hopefully didn't scare you too much. And I am happy to answer some questions, see what's in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatt, for this uh, excellent talk on uh, lung carcinoma, non-small cell carcinomas. Uh, I think I have put some questions in the chat box, if you can see them. Ah, okay. So is it really important to form grading on a biopsy? Um, I think sometimes it's complicated on small biopsies or on small biopsies for metastatic lymph nodes. Completely agree. Um, you know, I think it can be challenging to decide what the patterns are. I do make every effort to put them in a comment. Um, I, I think that it can be valuable uh, sometimes when clinicians are maybe making surgical decisions in very specific instances. And one of those instances would be micropapillary. Um, there is a suggestion in the literature that micropapillary patterns, because they're more likely to be associated with spread through air spaces, are more likely to have recurrence for a sub lobar resection, so a wedge resection. Um, and so in those particular cases, you know, I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, you know, if I tell them that there's a lot of micropapillary here and they're maybe on the fence of deciding, should we do a wedge or should we do a lobe, they might do a lobe in that case to ensure that they uh, don't have a higher chance of recurrence. So I completely recognize that it can be challenging. Um, I think it's reasonable to just put in the comment what you see. You don't have to give percentages in biopsies because of course that might change depending on what the final uh, resection looks like. So I don't do percentages in biopsies. Um, but if I see something that's predominant, I may mention that. Not always, though. Um, I think it's helpful if you can to try to just put it in a comment, if at all possible. Um, is the intraalveolar spread more to the primary adenocarcinoma than the metastatic? So that's a great question. Um, so typically, when you see uh, spread through air spaces, which I think is what you're asking about the intraalveolar spread, it tends to be most common with micropapillary patterns, uh, which typically are more likely to be primary. So I would I would say primary. That said, there are caveats, right? So pancreatic adenocarcinoma um, will will form lipidic patterns, um, especially if it has mucinous features and even non-mucinous features as well. And lipidic patterns to me always look more like their lung primary, but if pancreas is in the game, it can completely mimic a lung primary. Um, so just to keep that in mind. So while you can have spread through air spaces, I do think speaks more to a primary, um, not always. And in particular, pancreatic adeno, in particular when they have mucinous features, can look identical to lung. It can stain like lung. It can, you know, lung primary can stain like pancreatic, prim pancreatic primary. And so that's always a huge pitfall. I would say don't go out on a limb with those cases. Um, look at the radiologic findings and just tell your clinicians, look, it's way more likely that the patient has a pancreatic mass that it metastasized to the lung than if the patient had lung lesions that then metastasized to the pancreas. So sometimes you're just left playing a statistical game. Um, if, if you get a case that has stains or you end up doing stains for whatever reason, you know, having like a strong staining pattern that speaks to lung, TTF1, napsin, that can favor lung. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is they often don't. And so then you're sort of left with this indistinct immunophenotype. Okay, so does P63 highlight PBM the same way as P40? Uh, yes, it absolutely does. So you could use uh, P63 as well. And, and thank you for the nice presentation, thank you.
what are the prognostics for lung intestinal type adenocarcinoma in youngster and a younger population? Well, that's a good question. I don't know the prognosis right off the top of my head, um, but that's an interesting question. I'd have to look that up. I don't know their overall prognosis, but it is a good point to bring up enteric type adenocarcinoma, uh, similar to uh, pancreatic mets. Um, you can have a uh, enteric type adeno in the lung that will stain identical to like a metastatic colorectal adenocarcinoma. And another key factor to keep in mind, which I remember as a trainee being quite devastated when I learned this, is that some colon cancers can in fact stain with TTF1. Um, so I have had cases where it, the cases were stained and they were TTF1 positive and they said, oh, this must be a new lung primary. And I went back and pulled the colon cancer and stained it and it too stained with TTF1. Um, so when it comes to enteric morphologies, whether it's mucinous or more that colonic phenotype, you know, the hyperchromasia, the necrosis, you know, tall columnar cells, your staining is often not going to help you. Uh, is lung primary always negative for PAX-8? That is a great question. So large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, actually 30% are positive for PAX-8. Uh, lung primary adenocarcinomas are almost always negative. I do not believe I would feel comfortable making the diagnosis of a PAX-8 positive lung primary adeno. Uh, but to keep in mind, the large cell neuroendocrine can in fact be positive for PAX-8. Um, typically, it's, it's not a stain that you're usually doing, but sometimes you do get it um, if you're trying to uh, tell from a MET uh, from somewhere else. But PAX-8 is usually a good stain uh, for lung adeno versus uh, from somewhere else. How many sections should be taken to identify spread through airways? Is there an ideal number? Okay, so that's a good question. So there isn't um, an ideal set number in the literature right now. Uh, typically what I like to do with my um, lung cancers is I always try to tell the PAs, don't trim very, very close to the outside of the lesion. Now, if you can easily, if it's like a one centimeter lesion, you can easily fit it in one slide. Um, I always tell them to give me a good border around it, maybe at least a half centimeter. Um, but if it's a larger lesion, I try to get at least one full face and to have you know a half centimeter to a centimeter adjacent to the tumor just so you can identify that spread through air spaces around the edges. So, you know, unlike some other areas where you might be okay with, you know, kind of very closely cutting around the lesion, I typically won't do that um, for, uh, for um, lung cancers. And in terms of numbers of sections, I think it just depends on the size of the tumor. Uh, typically, the spread through air spaces, you're going to see it immediately adjacent and moving outwards from the edge of the tumor. So if you see, if you have the edge of the tumor, and then you have a section taken from far away, and there's like a floating chunk of tumor that's likely just butter, right? So you want to usually, you want to see a continuous spread from the defined edge of the tumor outwards into the alveolar spaces in order to call something stas. All right. Um, how do you interpret a weak expression of P40 with a solid type morphology? Good question. I don't know if you have TTF1 also being negative. If TTF, if TTF1 is negative, I'll typically call that squamous cell carcinoma. You can occasionally see some patchy weak P40 staining and then strong TTF1 staining. If it's less than 50%, um, I'll usually let that go, um, but I may recommend repeating the stains on a resection should they get a resection. Um, but usually with P40, you wanna see strong uh, staining greater than 50% to call a P40, uh, to call it a squamous cell carcinoma. But typically P40 staining will uh, equal squamous cell carcinoma. Um, okay, and then it looks like I have multiple questions. Can you explain the IHC criteria for mucinous adenocarcinoma? And then is there a different profile of biomarkers for mucinous adenocarcinoma? Um, so mucinous adenocarcinomas are often KRAS mutated. That tends to be more common. Um, we will send for the uh, full uh, NGS panel uh, for all of our lung tumors. So we don't have a separate panel for mucinous since we, we try to just look for everything in, in all of our uh, non-small cell cases, uh, but they do tend to be uh, KRAS positive. So if you're limited or you only can do one stain or you wanted to do an IHC or something like that, um, you might consider uh, KRAS uh, for mucinous. And then, um, and then in terms of the mucinous IHC, as I mentioned in the lecture, I typically won't do mucinous IHC because there often is so much overlap with the enteric phenotype because you have an enteric phenotype, right? And so you often will then have enteric IHC. And I think it can actually make things more confusing uh, for folks. Uh, so, you know, if you have a patient with a lung mass, lung lesions, odds are that they're going to have a full body PET scan or they're about to get a full body PET scan. And so 
the way I'll sign those cases out is I won't even do any IHC at all. Like if it's my in-house case and it's not a consult case, which often comes with full panels of IHCs already, I won't even do IHC. I'll just call it mucinous adenocarcinoma and in a comment say in the appropriate clinical and radiologic context that these are uh, consistent, this would be consistent with a lung primary. Um, however, uh, other primaries such as um, pancreatic biliary should be ruled out with imaging. Um, and if there is a large pancreatic mass, it's, it's going to be a met from the, from the pancreas, right? So, I mean, statistically, the odds of a lung cancer, a lung primary metastasizing to the pancreas is very, very low versus the odds of a pancreatic primary metastasizing to the lung, very, very high. Um, in terms of the stains themselves, mucinous adenos of the lung can be positive or negative for TTF1, CDX2, SATV2, um, uh, CK7, CK20. Um, so pretty much all the markers, even the ones that say, oh, this one is, you know, this one is specific. There's always a small number of cases that aren't. Um, so if you can, just avoid staining and just go with the imaging in terms of primary. Um, here's a question that says, I hope, hopefully that was helpful. Um, if TTF1 negative lung cancer, always negative for NAPS and A. In my experience, yes, there are a few rare tumors that are NAPS and A positive and TTF1 negative. So if you have, if you have a, a tumor that's NAPS and A positive, but TTF1 negative, start thinking about NAPS and A tumors. Um, I actually don't routinely do a NAPS and A as part of my panel, um, just because if you know lung lung cancers will drop NAPS and A first, and then they'll drop TTF1 if they're poorly differentiated. So I will typically just do a TTF1 um, and a NAPS and A. And of course, if you're worried about thyroid, you can do Pax8 to rule out thyroid. Someone asked about Pax8 earlier, um, and in those cases, you could also add a NAPS and A if you wanted. But I actually have found the longer I practice, the less I order a NAPS and A. Um, and it would be very unusual to have a tumor that's TTF1 negative and NAPSNA positive. I'm trying to think of, a, of an example and nothing is immediately coming to mind. Okay, does P53 and K67 help in the differential diagnosis of carcinoma versus mimics? So P53 can be useful if you're trying to differentiate, or the P40 can be useful if you're trying to differentiate peribronchiolar metaplasia, like what I have on my thank you picture here, um, versus uh, lipidic adenocarcinoma. So if you have an intact basal cell layer, that will tell you that what you're looking at is PBM. Um, the other differential for that, and I didn't mention it in this lecture, but is a bronchiolar adenoma. So bronchiolar adenomas can look very much just like adenocarcinoma, but they have an intact basal cell layer um, and they will be biopsied, right? So clinical history can be really helpful with bronchiolar adenomas. Again, very rare, thankfully. Um, they can be proximal or they can be distal. Um, Oftentimes, if you're lucky, you'll get the history that it's been there for a while, right? So BA sit there for a while. Um, these have also been called in the past ciliated muconodulary papillary tumors or CMPTs. These are very rare tumors, um, but they will also have an intact basal cell layer. And of course, BAs form uh, mass lesions and are often biopsies biopsied or resected. So that would be another example where that basal cell layer would be helpful to identify a benign process. They often also have goblet cells and cilia. Um, in terms of KI67, I wouldn't use that as a differentiation um, per se, because you can have an increased proliferative index in reactive pneumocytes, especially if you have a lot of acute lung injury in the background. Um, for me, I use KI67 when I have neuroendocrine lesions. So if I have a small crushed biopsy and I'm wondering, is it a carcinoid versus a small cell? Um, I'll do a KI-67. So I only use KI-67 in neuroendocrine lesions. I don't use it uh, when I'm differentiating uh, like a benign reactive process versus um, adenocarcinoma. I think using keratins to look at architecture can be more helpful in those cases. Okay, uh, what's your experience with TTF1 in small cell carcinoma? Great question. So small cell carcinoma is often positive for TTF1, but it doesn't have to be. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, I think small cell carcinoma is, is old school in a lot of ways in that it's a morphologic diagnosis. And you can have TTF1 be negative, you can have synapto be negative, chromo be negative, INSM1 be negative, you can have all the neuroendocrine markers negative, but if it looks like a small cell, even if it's TTF1 negative and neuroendocrine markers negative, you can call it a small cell carcinoma. Um, and as I mentioned before, I always do proliferative rates. Uh, I always do a K67 or a MIB1 um, on my uh, neuroendocrine cases. Um, it's not required in the new WHO, but it is uh, 
recommended or I forget the exact terminology that they use, but it's preferred to use. And I think it can help you, especially in small crushed cases of typical or atypical carcinoid tumors that can mimic small cell. And then you do the MIB and it has a 1% proliferative index. And you're like, whoa, that's not a small cell carcinoma. So that can be helpful. Okay, so TTF1 negative, Napsin negative, CK7 positive adenocarcinoma in the lung, as well as upper GI tract. How to determine primary? Okay, so this is the CK7 positive tumor but doesn't stain with anything else and maybe doesn't stain with GI markers. So again, for a case like this, you can't be definitive. Um, imaging is helpful. Clinical picture is helpful. You know, for these cases, I'll sign out, you know, moderately poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, see comment, and the comments say that this only stains with CK7. In the appropriate clinical radiographic context, this is compatible with a lung primary, but other primaries should be ruled out. Um, I think sometimes in Sometimes it's hard to, to kind of let go a little bit and say, yes, I think it's a lung primary, even if you don't have a specific lung marker. But if you have a smoker with a single lung lesion, even if it's only positive for CK7, that's going to be lung cancer. Uh, so just put that in a comment that you favor lung adenocarcinoma, perfectly compatible. Um, and, you know, these patients are going to get scanned anyways to look for any other areas of metastases. And that's not uncommon to see, especially in the poorly differentiated adenocarcinomas, that they're only positive for CK7. All right. These are great questions. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank All you right. so much. I think these are I think the I questions. I caught everything. Yeah. yeah, I think I think uh, these are the questions that I found uh, on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we don't, uh, I don't see much more here, but uh, oh, just here is one more question. I see that uh, you talked about morphology and immunostain. So uh, how much do you rely on uh, molecular markers? especially when uh, you have a problem between uh, you know primary versus secondary do you rely or do you take help of molecular markers at all so like if you had an egfr mutation or something along those lines um that's an interesting question so, you know i typically don't since you don't have molecular at the time of signing out your report molecular will take a week or two to come back so i typically don't use those i think it might be something more that would come up as a discussion in tumor board later uh, or if you wanted to sign out an addendum after the fact if you had a poorly differentiated tumor that wasn't staining for anything but it came back with the egfr mutation uh, i think then you could say this would further support a lung primary. Um, but I typically, you know, since you don't have those uh, when you're making your primary diagnosis, I wouldn't necessarily use those on the outset. Uh, but certainly something that could come up in a conversation later or potentially an addendum after the fact. Thank you. There is also I, a related question. Oh, sorry, you wanted to say something? Oh, I was going to say, you know, something I think to keep in mind is uh, common sense, right? And, and I know sometimes we get so caught up in, you know, we have to have the TTF1 or we have to have a specific stain that tells us it's, it's lung. But like I said, sometimes it's just a simple factor. If the patient has one large lung mass, it's going to be a lung primary, you know, and to just do molecular to see if there's anything that's targetable for the patient and go to the next case. All right, sorry, what was the next question? All right, no, I think the next question was somewhat related. So the question is about uh, what's the role of molecular markers in the diagnosis, mm -hmm. primary diagnosis of lung non-small cell carcinoma? Yeah, you know, sim similar answer. You know, I, I don't really use it as part of my primary diagnosis since you have to uh, typically wait a couple of weeks to get it to come back. So rely on your imaging and rely on your morphology. Right. No, I think that's great to know. And oh, here's another question. So someone wants you to explain the role of uh, P4, P40 in diagnosing lung cancers. Yeah, so I use P40 um, in particular when I see more poorly differentiated lesions. So I don't see good acinar, lipidic, papillary, micropapillary architecture. So if I see solid architecture or I can't tell what the architecture is, depending on how small or crushed the biopsy is, I will use a P40 together with a TTF1 as my primary panel. If you have a strong P40 positivity, that's going to be consistent with a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, I will also use P40 as a basal cell marker, as I mentioned. Um, in particular cases, if you're trying to decide if something is a reactive peribronchiolar metaplasia um, or possibly a rare bronchiolar adenoma, um, an intact basal cell layer with P40 um, can help you make that differentiation. So those are the um, situations in which I use P40 in non-small non cell. Right. Just, just one last question, I think, about P40. So, uh, 
on yeah. biopsy specimens, how do you diagnose adenosquamous carcinoma? Or what is your criteria to ah, diagnose adenosquamous carcinoma? That's a great question, actually. So you can't diagnose it on a biopsy. You could suggest it. And the caveat I will say is when you're suggesting an adenosquamous carcinoma, you want to look at the cells that are staining, right? So you have, let's say you have a P, P40 and a TTF1. Are they staining the same cells or are they staining different cells? So if you have a population that's staining with TTF1 and a different population that's staining with P40, that's I think when you can suggest an adenosquamous carcinoma. It's not uncommon in a small percentage, I should say my version of not uncommon is not always the same as what's out there. I'm a little skewed with the consult service, but sometimes you'll see cases that are strong TTF1 positive with some weak focal positivity for P40 in the same cells. For those cases, I will call it an adenocarcinoma. On the opposite side, you will see cases that have strong diffuse P40 staining, but some weak focal staining in the same cells with TTF1. For those cases, I call them squamous cell carcinomas. So just to summarize, so if you have different populations staining for TTF and P40, you can suggest an adenosquamous carcinoma. You need a resection to look for the relative percentages in order to definitively top line it. Um, if you have the same cell staining, look for the stronger stain pattern. So if it's more strong, more cells are straining strong diffuse for TTF1 with only weak focal P40, adenocarcinoma. More strong diffuse staining for P40 with only weak focal TTF1, squamous cell carcinoma. Right. Hopefully that was helpful. All right. No, thank you. I think uh, there is a compliment for you from one of our viewers from Brazil. I have added oh. that on the chat box. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Brazil, that's so far away. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. So yeah, it, it seems that uh, uh, as one of our viewers have mentioned that uh, Dr. Butt has a very informative and it's, it's an excellent uh, atlas and pulmonary pathology. So, I mean, uh, you guys can definitely uh, refer to her uh, textbook on pulmonary pathology or the atlas so that would be helpful to you as well so, uh, i think with that we have come to the end of today's session uh, dr but thank you so much for this excellent session and as you can see that uh, we have a lot of compliments from our viewers they really liked it and especially they have liked the uh, different cases that you have shared with them and uh, you would be happy to hear that you had uh, viewers from so many different countries i could keep track of uh, our viewers from as many as 16 countries, including France, Brazil, <laughs> Cambodia, Canada, Bahrain, Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, Turkey, Czech Republic, uh, Ukraine, Thailand, etc. Uh, from wow. India, joined as well. Hello to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Thank you so viewers. much for listening. Thanks a lot. And if you like our lectures, so, and uh, somebody was asking that how to know about the lecture. So the best way I would say that please subscribe to the YouTube channel and the Facebook page if you follow. So you will get notified about the uh, upcoming lectures. So I think that would be the easiest for you. And uh, we also have a web website where we also publicize about the uh, upcoming lectures as well. So that would be the easiest. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Butt, for our next lecture is coming up. So let me share the screen quickly. So that is on dermatopathology. And uh, our speakers will be from Australia, Melanoma Institute, so Dr. Richard Scolier, Nigel Meher, and Andrew Detrick. So they would be discussing on how to diagnose borderline cutaneous melanocytic lesions. And that would be on March 7th. And the time will be uh, it would be 5 p.m. Pacific time or 8 p.m. Eastern time because we have to adjust with the time, time zone in Australia. So that would be a morning or noon time in Australia. So hope to see you then. I think that would be a great talk. So sit till then and thank you. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Bud, for this great lecture for all thank of us. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks,